Good afternoon, I'm Hannah Dukas and I'm part of the ACE Emerging Professionals Committee. Um, I represent WSP, I'm a structural engineer working at WSP at the moment. So I'd like to welcome you to this ACE Emerging Professionals webinar. Um, it's organised by our London and South East group. And today we're going to focus on the iconic Lloyd's 86 building in London. I'd like to welcome Rob Kinch. He's a technical director at WSP and will guide us through the journey of the history and background of this iconic building and how it was designed and built. Um, Rob led the structural engineering teams designing the satellite towers around the perimeter, which provided vertical access routes for people and services and the plant roofs that sit on top of them, together with a large number of other elements. At the end, there'll be time for Q&A, and I'll explain in a minute um, how you can um, pop your questions through. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so that for the best experience, uh, we recommend you listening through your headphones. But if you are listening through your headphones, please can you make sure that you're on mute um, so that um, you're breathing or no um, external sounds come through. Um, Regarding the questions, um, you should find a box on your right hand side and if you can type in your questions, you can type in your questions throughout the presentation. Um, however, these will be answered at the end. Um, don't worry if you miss anything, we'll be uploading this um, webinar onto our website um, so that you can listen to us again. Right, I'd like to now pass you over to Rob Kinch. Thank you. Ken, are you going to move it on to the next slide, or have I now got control? You have control. Okay. It's not responding very encouragingly. Ah, okay. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rob Kinch from uh, WSP, though, of course, the Lloyds building was um, during my Arab phase. Uh, the Lloyds 86 building, I think nobody's going to argue with me if I say that it, it is truly iconic um, and probably did more than any other building in certainly in Britain in the built environment to cause people to take an interest and have a view about architecture because while this was rather a controversial building when it was um, first built and possibly is still quite a controversial building it wasn't possible for anybody to have an opinion about this without consequently having an opinion about any other building so um, it did great things for making people think about buildings um, incidentally it was also listed at grade one in in 2011 um, the youngest ever building in Britain to be um, listed at grade one so moving on I'll just tell you a little about myself I'm the son of an architect um, my father I thought did some wonderful work this was his um, headquarters for the cement and concrete whoops back a bit This was his um, headquarters building for the Cement and Concrete Association um, at Wexham Springs near Slough. Um, you'd hardly tell it was for the Cement and Concrete Association, would you? It's uh, pretty brutalist. I always thought this was a wonderful building that should have been listed. My father, a very modest man, always poo pooed this idea. And one day when I had a conversation with him about it again, he did say that an Italian engineer had written to him to say how much he liked the building. And I asked who it was, and he said, oh, he, he couldn't remember. So I tossed in the only Italian engineer that I could think of, and that was, of course, Pierre Luigi Nervi. And he said, yes, that's right, that's who it was. I said, Daddy, you still got the letter. He said, oh, no, 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 I threw it away. Head in hands time, head in hands time. Anyway, um, so, engineering architecture buildings have been with me for a very long time 
as the next slide will illustrate, perhaps. Yeah. So this is me at the tender age, probably about seven, with um, one of my earliest forays into the world of design and engineering. And um, I've been doing it pretty much on and off ever since. So um, I do tend to digress a little bit, but that's the, the end of that little bit of digression. Um, back to the Lloyds building. Um, Lloyds are insurance underwriters, um, which basically means that now they'll insure almost anything. But originally, where they, when they began life in Edward Lloyd's coffee shop back in 1688, um, it was principally ships and the goods that the ships were carrying that they were underwriting. And by the time they got to the 20th century, um, they were working, that, forming their underwriting role. Um, pretty much always in the, a room. It was known as the Lloyd's Room. And in a moment, we might actually see the Lloyd's Room from the 1958 building. There we have it. Um, so they, they were very used to working in single space. The 1958 building had been anticipated to take them through into the 21st century. However, <clears throat> in the mid excuse me, in the mid 1970s, um, it was becoming obvious that this building was not going to make it much further in supporting their activities. And so they held an architectural competition uh, to find an architect to build, design the new building. Now, there was so much underwriting activity going on with Lloyd's now that there was nowhere in the city of London that could actually accommodate their, their building, their, their activities in a single room. And while the architects, there were a number, number of quite well-known architects invited to the competition, Arab Associates, um, IM Pei, um, uh, Norman Foster, uh, and of course, Richard Rogers. And this deck is moving very slowly. Anyway, while most of the entrants into the competition, most of the invitees in the competition came forward with um, really sort of beautiful sketches and diagrams and illustrations of what they were hoping to design for Lloyd's. Um, Richard Rogers came forward with some ideas and some sketches. And the, the kernel of the idea was that while Lloyd's could no longer find a space big enough to accommodate their room, they could have a single room, um, which is the base of an atrium, which you see here, and then they can have gallery floors around the atrium and interlink the floors with escalators. So while they're not actually on the same level, they are all actually in the same volume, in the same space, breathing the same air. Um, this was the idea that captured Lloyd's imagination and Richard Rogers won the competition to uh, design the building. Now I must take you back to a little bit of architectural history. I'm not sure this is digressing because this does actually tell part of the story. This deck is so slow. But all being well, the next image that you'll see, yep, um, is, is an illustration by a guy called Ron Heron. Um, who was part of a group um, called Archigram, who came out of the Architectural Association um, in the 1960s. Peter Cook was another of them. And they had all sorts of wonderful ideas about walking cities and plug-in cities, perhaps an idea that has yet to come of, come of age these days with our um, uh, modern methods of construction and rather more modular um, buildings. But this was an illustration that um, Ron Heron created. And the reason why I show it is that I think you can go without too much of a leap of imagination from this diagram to Centre Pompidou in Paris, which is due up next shortly, I hope. <laughs> and as I say, I hope it's not too great a leap of imagination to to get from Ron Heron's illustration 
to Sandra Pompidou. Now, Sandra Pompidou was a collaboration between um, Richard Rogers and Renzo Cano. Um, probably their first and almost only, but certainly their greatest collaboration, though they remain very good friends. Um, and what they strove for in Paris, this is an art gallery, if any of you have been to it, and it's still an art gallery if you haven't, um, but what they were striving for uh, was the creation of very open floor plates. And the device they used to achieve this moving at snail-like pace onwards, was a device called a gerberet. So this, this is a little diagram showing how the structure worked. There was a, a truss that spanned the width of the building, which I recall was about 40 metres. That was supported on a, a cast steel gerberet. Um, it's just what it's called. I think this is probably the name of the device. And the gerberet sits on a column, on a bearing on the column. The cantilever's forward a little way and to pick up the truss. And then the backspan of the gerberet is tied down with a tension element down to the foundations. And this device allowed them to create a completely clear floor plate um, and locate all the building services around the outside. So lifts and services and escalators and all the other um, building services components that make a building work um, were on the outside and not disturbing the inner space, which can be uh, set up and easily divided for whatever exhibition happens to be going on. And what's going on now is that little wheel is spinning around and we'll wait for the next slide. The, right, the, this slide, um, you can see quite clearly, I think, the, the, um, the column, the gerberet, the trusses spanning their 40 metres and the tension tie down. Um, incidentally, these trusses were made um, in Germany and shipped into the nearest railhead and in Paris. And the night the first one was brought in, it took them eight hours to get from the railhead to the site of Pompidou. Um, by the end of it, they were doing it in just over 20 minutes. It must have been terrifying. Um, anyway, and in this image, you can see that clearly at ground level, um, the, the, the back span to, or the, the, the space between the column and the tie down um, does take up a, a, an amount of space. Now, as Rogers and the other engineers moved towards the design of Lloyd's, the, the concept was very much drawn from the Centre Pompidou um, uh, exercise. So it was, a, it was intended to be a steel building. There was going to be um, a gerberet type detail, and there were going to be tie downs. Now, when we get to the next slide. Yeah, okay, so the next slide, the building. The building is in the city of London, which of course is a very crowded, bustling, busy area. And it became rapidly apparent that the gerberet and the space needed to get the backspan to its tension tie down. Um, couldn't be accommodated within a building. And if it happened around the outside of the building, what was left of the inside wasn't actually worth having. Um, and also it became apparent, and I think this was probably a regulatory thing, um, where you could, you could build in Paris without needing to fire protect the steelwork for that type of building. An office building in London, if you built it in steel, it had to be fire protected. Now, um, at the time, probably the only way you could fire protect steel work in an external environment was to case it in concrete. Now, this idea was absolute anathema to the architects and indeed all of the design team. So, you know, the possibility of having steel work cased in concrete just to give it fire protection, there was no way that was happening. So the building morphed into a concrete structure and the the key development, I suppose you'd say, is that the concrete columns, which were all cast in situ, um, had a reinforced concrete bracket lowered onto them, which then cantilevered forward um, to pick up the, the floor structure. The floor structure is, is actually quite complex, and I'll tell you a little more about it 
um, later and also illustrate why it was quite so complex. But we have a number of devices here. We have the bracket, we have something called the yoke, and the use of that uh, will become apparent. An acoustic panel that supported um, the floor plate, and then um, pre-stressed inverted U-beam, which is this character here, which also served to support 550D beam grid. So the next slide will show more of that particular story. Gosh, that was quick. So, okay, what we're seeing here is a corner of the building. We have four columns. This is the corner of an atrium. So you can see that while the brackets out here are just uh, single cantilevers coming off the corner of the atrium, it's a double cantilever and of course has to be reinforced and its reinforcement has to fit over the bars of the column, which were cast in situ, or the whole, <laughs> it's game over. If it doesn't fit, you're knackered. So we have the, the beam grid down here. We have stub columns coming up off the beam grid, supporting an acoustic panel. And the acoustic panel had a concrete floor on top of it. Um, and then above that, there was a raised floor. And I, I won't tell you the story of how that was developed now, but we'll come to that a little later, towards the end of the talk. So in a little more detail, um, the image of a, a bracket with its yoke. The particular bracket that's identified here uh, is one that has the main building bracing attaching to it. But interestingly, the main building bracing is actually steel tubes cased in concrete. <laughs> There's a time when pragmatism has to take over. We just couldn't just couldn't manage those in reinforced concrete. Um, other elements here, we have the yoke, which is lowered onto the bracket and it sits on elastomeric bearings. And the reason for that is that when, when this device carries the inverted U-beam and the inverted U-beam is pre-stressed, then of course the beam will, will shorten and the bearings prevent the shortening of the inverted U-beam from dragging the columns in. Uh, so we then also have dowels, four dowels that are fixed down into the bracket, which locate into pockets in the yoke element, um, which are then, after the, after the beam has been pre-stressed, they are then grouted up so that the floor is able to um, give a very positive tie-in for the column to um, link the whole building floor plate together. And now, all being well, the real animal. Yep, so there we are. That That is indeed um, a yoke in place. You can see the pockets that will be grouted up once the steel dowels are in. Um, and these bars are actually what hang the um, the, the inverted U-beams that subsequently get pre-stressed. Now, <laughs> a little bit of digression. Um, you can see that these the, the bracket drops rather nicely over the columns here. But when the building was essentially finished, I had to go back for some reason or other. And there was somebody was fixing the um, the fire hose reel um, pedestals, and these were it was rather a clever idea. The the fire hose reel was on a horizontal drum within the raised floor, and the pedestal was then being fixed down onto the the yoke, and so the, the pedestal would poke up through the raised floor, and the hose would pop out of the top. So in the event of fire, you grab the hose and rush away and the hose reel unspins itself from the drum below the floor and you put out the fire. However, the guy who was busily fitting these pedestals found that when he drilled into the yoke, he kept hitting steel. So he got pragmatic about it and got himself a diamond coring bit. And when I got to sight, there were all these bits of rebar scattered over the floor. Yes, well, that caused some consternation, and uh, we, we then did some more calculations and were able to establish that despite having lost some of the centres of some of these yoke bars, um, there was still enough to keep the inverted U-beams hanging off the, off the yokes. So, Moving on, this this is indeed the the bracket for the corner of the atrium that I mentioned, and you can see that there's a a fairly substantial amount of reinforcement passing through these in both directions to enable the cantilever to happen. And this is the kind of reinforcement of the in situ columns that 
these had to be lowered over and always fit. You can see here that there is a, um, a template device being used to position the bars and you might think that's quite a lot of steel. Well, you'd be absolutely right because when the building morphed from steel to concrete, I'm afraid we were a bit over optimistic on sizing some of the columns and they just weren't big enough. So some of the Lloyds columns have got 13% reinforcement and that's not at laps. Uh, indeed, there aren't any laps because there wasn't space for laps. They were all coupled. <laughs> so there we go. We had to work quite hard with some of those. And that's a view of a floor under construction. We've got the, the inverted U-beams in position here. We've got brackets and columns. We've got the beam grid, um, stub columns that will eventually have the acoustic panels um, supported on, on from them. Um, interestingly, these beams and, and the, the, um, the cells formed within the beam grid the beams themselves are absolutely have an absolute right angle aris on the bottom corners so the sides are truly vertical and the soffit is truly horizontal and as we began the process the the industry which is let's face it often very conservative said you 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 can't do that mate you need to put a draw on the mold or we'll we'll never demold it and we got involved with a, an American, a guy called um, Vince Kelly, um, who was a renowned false work designer. And we worked with him to design a set of false work and with the architect uh, that meant we could get an absolutely true square Aris, a perpendicular size. And I think it was at Tarmac's base in Fulham, as it then was, um, we did create a mock-up of one bay or a part of one bay of the building so that contractors tendering for the superstructure could understand that how they might actually develop a formwork system that gave them the square aris. Um, Vince Kelly's system had hundreds of components and the, the winning contractor of the superstructure the, who won the tender was uh, Gleason's, MJ Gleason. And they had a, possibly an even better formwork designer who came up with a much, much simplified system with many fewer parts that delivered exactly what was wanted. So, um, but the, the important thing there was to show the industry that this could be done so that they couldn't say it couldn't. Moving on. Now, yeah, things don't always go smoothly, even with a building as well thought through as the Lloyd's 86 building. And on the left, you see the column with the brackets coming off it and the inverted U-beams and so on all supported from them. And this is kind of the moment diagram you might expect of the column from that arrangement. Now, what people hadn't quite picked up was that when you'd cast this and you pre-stressed it, the beam above wasn't actually acting as a prop. So you've got a bending moment diagram that's probably a bit going on down below, of course, which I didn't draw. But basically what you get is a much bigger bending moment than you might have expected and possibly going the other way. And uh, the columns all cracked on the outside face, which um, caused a considerable amount of consternation and uh, led to a substantial increase in the amount of uh, rebar in those particular columns. Fortunately, those weren't our 13 percenters. And a view of the room again, and this down here, the podium down here, um, within this is the lutein bell, something that's been part of the Lloyd's um, paraphernalia for hundreds of years. And uh, the looting bell is rung once for bad news and twice for good news. So if a ship is found, it's two rings. And if a ship is lost, it's one ring. I think everybody would have been on tenterhooks after the ringing of one peal of the bell. Now, if you get the, and this is kind of a digression, I suppose, but if you get the chance to visit the Lloyds building, it's sometimes open um, for open house in September. So I rather think that's not happening this year. Um, you will see that there are trusses that support the escalators that uh, rise up through the atrium. And if you look 
closely on the cast steel bracketry that support the trusses, you'll see the initials SSL, sorry, SLL and DGC. Now, I'm not going to tell you who those initials belong to, but they were the architect and the engineer who were working on the design of these particular elements. And when Steve Larson and Glenn Kaler, oh, I've gone and done it. When they visited the steel casting fabricator who was going to make these, the fabricator said, well, you know, if you like, I could put your initials on the bracket. And Steve and Glenn said, oh yeah, that sounds good fun. Which was, it was for them until it was spotted by Richard Rogers, John Young, who was the partner in charge at Richard Rogers at the time. Um, and they went absolutely apeshit because the, the authorship of the Lloyds building was supposed to be a very democratic, egalitarian endeavor with, with no one standing out ahead of anyone else in terms of authorship. And here we are, good old Steve and Glenn getting their initials on a bit of their work. Right, so now, now we're moving towards me telling you uh, in a little more detail about the building elements that fell to me to design. And, and these were the, <coughs> excuse me, these, these were the satellite towers around the outside, which um, uh, Hannah mentioned earlier as being for, for vertical access. So, over in the background, we've got Tower 1, Tower 2, 3, 4, 5, and just popping its head up over there is Tower 6. Um, tower 6 and Tower 4 are principally firefighting access, so it's a firefighting lift all in precast concrete panels with the, an escape stair. Um, tower 5, 3, and 1 are all about vertical access, so here we have the wall climber lifts for um, uh, people access to the various floors. It's also um, they have three of the major plant rooms on the top from which the um, services are distributed to the floors below. Um, <coughs> tower two is a kind of a slight novelty. It's got the plant room, but it doesn't have the wall climber lifts. It's tucked away underneath. It's got a, a goods lift um, and also a fireman's lift. So there are three firefighting lifts in the building. Um, <coughs> so um, these are the bits that fell to me and a salutary and uh, sometimes terrifying experience it was too. Almost as terrifying as this presentation, if it doesn't move on quickly. Okay, another quick view, wall climb lift going up. The If you ever get the chance to ride in these, they are great fun. Um, I think they now travel at about five meters per second. And the sensation of speed you get when you're on an up and a down goes past or vice versa is is very great fun um i also had an occasion to um you'd have noticed the sort of blue crane like things on the top of the plant rooms those are actually the um the cleaning cranes that um lower baskets down the side of the building to enable maintenance and cleaning to be undertaken and not long after the building had opened we were getting reports that some of the lift guides were wobbling but of course, as any good structural engineer knows, lift guides don't wobble, so you tell everybody that they don't. But the stories continued, so we had to do something about it. So very early one morning, um, my director and I went down and my di director rode up. There is a little well in the top of the cars. Uh, my director rode up on top of the car with the express lifts staff. And as they went, they rocked it to and fro to see if they could get to a point where there's some movement in the guides. And when they found some, then it was my job up on the plant room roof to get into the cradle. Uh, the jib was extended over the edge. And mm, I haven't had many moments like that in my life as the, as the cradle went over the edge of the plant room. It's, it's quite a long way down. And then down I went until I could see what was causing the, the wobble. And I'm afraid it was just an awful detail. There was an arm that came out from the from the structure to, and this was nothing to do with me. I'm not going to tell you who designed it, but I do know. Um, an arm came out to, to restrain the lift guides. And where it's attached back to the main building, um, it was a single bolt fixing with absolutely no attempt to fix a secondary lock nut or jam it up in any way. And of course, after a, a 
few transits of the lifts, the vibration just causes the nut to shake itself loose. So, um, well, we I think we have been sending somebody around with lock nuts or we smashed the threads with a cold chisel. So, good God, how did that happen? Perfect, the next slide. So, um, this is actually Tower 1, um, it, which is fairly sort of typical in terms of the details of all of the satellite towers. Um, if I can just tell you a little about how the stability works, um, you're going to have to use your imagination to some degree here. Mm -hmm. But the floor slabs are actually tied into the beams. And what you can't see in this photograph, because it's not there, is a link slab that gets cast, it, it, it's, it's rested on this beam and then has um, a, an infill pocket reinforced and concreted that makes it um, an integral element of that floor plate. And then under horizontal loading, um, the satellite tower, which actually extends, I think the columns are probably about uh, 15 meters away from the main building floor plate. Um, the floor plate spanners horizontal beams, if you like, horizontal diaphragms, to the bracing in the end frame of the satellite tower, and then back to the main building here. Now, the, the, the bracing out here um, spans up the, I think it's about 12 storeys of the building, um, up to level 13, roof level, where a very substantial T-shaped beam um, spans out to provide it with lateral support, horizontal support at roof level. Um, this substantial beam is T-shaped in plan. The, the table of the T spans between two of the main building columns, um, while the stalk of the T spans out to connect to the top of that bracing frame. So, so the floor slab is braced by the bracing frame at the outboard end, and by <coughs> being connected back to the main building um, at the main building end. But if we had simply gone for an in situ um, connection back to the main building, um, this the, the the link slab element would have been sufficiently stiff that it, it would have been trying to act as the root of this as an entire cantilever and being much stiffer than the bracing. Um, but it wasn't strong enough. So what we did at the end where the link slab met the main building, um, we had a, a pair of plates, horizontal plates coming off the link slab which um, nested over and under another plate coming out of the main building floor slab and popped a pin through. So the whole of the satellite tower can actually move, rotate relative to the, the main building floor plate. Um, and furthermore, that can, ooh, goodness gracious. Okay, well, maybe I'll tell you about that bit later. Ooh, no, I do need to go back. Right. Um, the diagram on the right is, is explains how we connect up the columns and beams. Well, the columns and beams and indeed the bracing elements are all um, genuine reinforced concrete. Um, the devices we use for connecting them all together are much more to the world of um, structural steel connections. So um, this is the end of a beam and at the core of that connection is a large diameter uh, steel CHS section. We have plates welded onto that that get um, have bracing may have bracing connected onto them. At further plates coming off to which the beam reinforcement is welded, and then the bottom of that CHS has a plate welded to it that has um, bolts pre-located in it um, that are held in position by, um, by by flat nuts on the underside of that plate. Um, which can then drop into the top of the column. And the top of the column is very much like the top of the beam node, um, where we have a, another steel plate coming across, circular plate, um, with a smaller CHS coming off that, with a series of stiffeners outstanding from it, and with in the top plate uh, a series of holes drilled, so that the bolts from the column coming from above, or the beam, as, if that may be the case, um, can drop down through into the gaps between the stiffeners and get bolted up. Moving swiftly on. Right, so um, these are, you'll have guessed, the bottom and the top of a column. 
Um, we have the bolts with their flat nuts holding them in position. Um, what you're seeing there is a grout tube that um, we were able to, having assembled the uh, columns and beams on site, we were able to pour grout down this to, um, to, to enclose and encase the joint in concrete. So bolts pop down, top of the column is the same as the top of the beam, um, the holes through which the beams locate, stiffeners, stiffeners, inner CHS. So now we'll move on to Anglian concrete. Anglian concrete are the people who made all of the reinforced concrete, the precast concrete components for the satellite towers. Um, they don't exist anymore, but they were based up in, in uh, near Norwich. And what you're seeing here is the a typical beam node plate on the bottom that you can't really see, plate on the top with the stiffness and the holes, uh, plate for bracing connection. And uh, the white, of course, is because we've done some dye penetrant testing to make sure there are no, no cracks in the welds. So these, so these components are assembled, reinforcement welded onto the plates, and then they're cast into, they're, they have their concrete knuckle cast around them. Um, and so it's very, it's very much a stage by stage exercise. And so the, the, the beam nodes cast into their concrete before being taken away um, and being assembled in a mould with the rest of the beam reinforcement and being cast into the beam. You'll notice that the approach to um, health and safety and PPE was very different back in the 1980s to where we are now. Um, I think I prefer where we are now. So here we have it, beam, beam nodes now cast into the beams and loaded onto a trailer within the yard to be taken away to the storage area, ready for um, trucking down to London and delivery to site. It, it, it was uh, quite extraordinary the rate at which the satellite towers went up. The, the picture I showed you earlier, which was um, two lift columns and slabs for tower one, um, actually went up overnight, which kind of took me aback because it took me longer than that to design the bloody things. Um, but what was sort of quite, a, oops, where are we going now? But what, well, we can stay there. But what was sort of slightly unsettling about it was that uh, for some reason it seemed terribly difficult to get the right length of link slab. And there was certainly one occasion when I had to call Anglia and Precast and say, look, I know you're casting those link slabs tomorrow. Could you make them 100 mil longer, please? Because I just figured out they were going to just drop straight through the gap. <laughs> Anyway, this, this is a junction, um, an assembled junction between column or beam node rather and the column. Um, you can see that we were quite thoughtful and cast in sockets so that um, bracketry that supported the building services that ran down from the plant rooms above could be um, easily um, and, and positively fixed and uh, in a way that meant we were being deliberate about it. Um, the space here had a piece of formwork assembled around it um, which had um, air vents on top of it. And what you can't see around the back is the top of that, um, the, the grout pipe that I described earlier, down which the grout is poured to encase this in concrete and um, give it the appropriate weather protection and fireproofing. Okay, so I said I'd, the, we're now into the final three slides, but I said I'd tell you a little more about why the floor was so was so complex. Um, the air conditioning system that was adopted for the building um, was, it's called a displacement system. So if we've got any mech engine on the line, they'll know far more about it than I do. But the the raised floor is a plenum into which air is, is pushed, conditioned air is pushed from the external ducting system. Um, that is then drawn up using a device called a fan air terminal up through twist grills into the floor and it comes in at a, a fairly low temperature and wafts its way up taking away the the excess heat from people and desks and machinery and computer equipment and so on and is then extracted through the through the light system um, now that's not unusual though lloyd's probably was one of the earlier um, floor displacement systems but what was un unusual about lloyd's was that here the air taken back into the ceiling was then drawn down through 
the inner inner cavity of a triple glazed cladding system um, before it was then taken back and and either either reconditioned or, or exhausted. Um, and the reason for that was that you could then warm up that cavity, warm up the inner pane of glass, so that you don't get a cold downdraft off the off the windows. So that's that's kind of why we ended up with a system that was relatively complicated. We had the a lighting zone within the depth of the beam grid. Um, we had a zone above the beam grid and within the depth of the um, the the, um, the floor carrying stubs um, that allowed cabling and sprinklers and so on to be run around at high level in the floor. We then get the acoustic panel, which does some um, improvement for the floors below. And then, of course, the void for the um, the air to the, air, the floor plan for air to be pushed into the floor. So the next is my final slide. You'll probably be glad to know. And there was there was one other bit that fell to me to design, and that was the oops, back we go. And that was the the flue stack on the outside. Now, this this was a, a, an interesting design. It consists of um, five tubes, four on the corner of the square and one centrally, um, with horizontal tubes connecting them up at each floor level. Um, and so this flue structure um, acted, if you like, as a Virendil truss um, against lateral load spanning from the lower ground floor up to um, level 13, where a device up here that you can just about see, otherwise known as the tennis racket, um, is, is providing support at the roof level. Um, now, the, the, this had its moments, and there was one interesting time. The 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 flanges on the on the steel tubes were um, 40 mil thick steel plate, um, and we had specified them as being um, a 50 double E steel, which is equivalent now to I think a, an S355 K2. So um, quite a special steel in terms of the the the, the fracture toughness. And um, the reason for that was that they were all going to be welded onto the tubes. Um, they were going to be in sort of so fairly high residual stresses because of the welding. And of course, they were going to be in the open air, so um, they, they potentially can get pretty chilly. Um, and welds and seals can actually sort of spontaneously fracture under such circumstances. There, there was a bridge in France, I think, that had a problem of that sort and uh, collapsed. Um, anyway, so we specified 50 double E, and I went on holiday. You should never go on holiday. And uh, while I was away, one of our more senior directors had a meeting with the people who were making the flues, and uh, they said, could they use grade 50 B for the plate? And um, so dear old John, that's as much as you're getting his name, um, telephoned the office and he said, is there, is there any difference in strength between 50B and double E? And he was told no. So he went back to the factory and he said, yeah, that's, that's fine, of course you can use B, which was a much cheaper and more easily obtained material. And so they duly obtained an awful lot of 50B plate, um, which I think, I think came in pieces about two and a half metres by four, um, and there were a lot of them. And uh, I got back from my holiday, discovered what has happened to my horror. And we duly had samples taken from the plate that had been ordered and indeed now delivered and had it checked for what its, its Sharpie values were. They were useless. This stuff sort of almost broke as soon as it looked at the machine that was going to um, check its, its fracture toughness. And um, anyway, so there was much, gnashing of teeth and pulling out of hair. Um, but I suppose we all got kind of lucky um, and it was possible to get the material properties up from 50B to 50EE um, through a process of heat treating. So we all got, got away with that. And the tubes themselves were fine. Tubes, were, steel tubes tend to be a better quality material um, than other plates. Okay, guys, that's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for that presentation. We now have um, the question session. So if anybody has any questions, please can you write them um, in the box? Um, and then I will let Rob know. But as we wait for some questions to come through, um, I have some questions for you, Rob. How long did the whole, um, how long were you working on the Lloyds building and how long did it take for it to be constructed? Oh gosh, well I think I think the design sort of began in about 1978 and of course the building opened in 86. Um, my personal involvement um, began in I think about 1981 when I was actually um, a resident engineer for the demolition of the, the in fact the Lloyd's 1938 building which was which occupied oh. the site where the new building was to be built um, and having been on site for the demolition of that building and um, construction of the basement. Um, I was then invited into the office to see if I'd like to have a go at the superstructure. Um, and so that would have been probably early 82. Um, the structure was completed probably in kind of 84, 85 ish. Um, but, but there were always things going on. So my, my involvement um continued all the way through to the, the the end in fact beyond because um as we all know concrete intention cracks and um the the difficulty in in an external environment is that if it rains you get water um collecting in the cracks and when it stops raining the surface of the concrete dries out but the crack remains wet which means that it's uh, very visible and so the the Lloyd's facilities management team would see these cracks and go, Rob, Rob, we found some cracks. And so I'd pull out my crack microscope and whistle off down to Leadenhall Street and get to know my old friends, the cracks again. They were always the same ones. Um, but uh, every time they got a change in the FM team, it was Rob. And off I wow. went. Wow, it's quite a few years. I don't know, again, Indeed. anybody, please send through any questions. Um, I'll be looking on my little question thing if any come up. Um, but I have another question for you, Rob. Why do you think, because of course, this building is very iconic, like you said at the beginning, it was listed as grade one, as one of the youngest buildings to be listed as a grade one. But why don't you think in today's arch architecture, especially looking at London, that why didn't Richard Rogers design of having a lot of the um, elements, especially MEP elements on the external side of the building. How, why don't you think that's been adopted as much? Oh, that, that is a good question. Um, the, the reason why they, they were all placed around the perimeter on the Lloyds building, I mean, to, to some extent it was kind of a vestigial exercise after um, the, 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 the Pompidou building, but clearly it was also what you had to do to um, come up with the clear floor place that was the, the ambition for the building. Um, I think probably to do it is also quite an expensive exercise because if, if you think about it normally, if you if you have um, a duct delivering air within a building, you don't have to do much to it other than insulate it. Whereas um, the duct work on, the, on Lloyd's had to be um, protected against the weather, it had to be insulated, it needed um, vapour barriers in it. Um, and in fact, this probably is a pretty open secret, um, a number of years after the Lloyd's building did open, um, the ductwork needed to have an awful lot of maintenance carried out on it because the, um, basically I think the, the vapour barriers had failed, the insulation had got uh, wet um, and so as we all know wet insulation doesn't do a lot for insulating things um, and it's probably a more expensive way around to do it. To do it. Oh okay. No, interesting. We've got another question come through, Rob. Um, you showed column bending and moment diagrams and how the moments ended up 
much greater because the beam above didn't prop the column. Is that because the bearings on the yokes only transmitted vertical load? Sorry, I think I think maybe did, did I not say? But when the beams were were stressed, yes, not only did they shorten, um, but of course they also lifted themselves off the force work that had been supporting them, um, and that meant that the load transferred back into the bracket before the next level of beam up had been installed. I think maybe I forgot to say that. Apologies. No. Right. Anybody else? Any questions? Please send them through. I've got another question for you, Rob. Would you, if you were brought this, um, if you were brought this same situation and design today, would you, would you still go ahead and do it? Because it sounded very complicated. There was lots of different. It was very different at the time, like you said, especially back in the 1980s. Um, or do you think? What would you think you'd do? My goodness, that, that is a difficult question. Um, I, I, I think you've got, to, you've got to put yourself in the role of, of a client who's having a building built for themselves. Um, you can have something very sort of anonymous, curtain walled and, you know, nobody notices it. Or... Or if you want something that is iconic and people see it and they go, oh, Lloyd's, oh. they're the underwriters, then you do something like this. I mean, it, it sort of, it, it, it's, it's interesting that people will use buildings as a way of, of gaining publicity and advertising themselves. I think, I think probably at the moment, um, maybe not just at the moment, but of recent years, um, universities in the UK have been um, spending a lot of money on better designs, very much more, um, in some cases, iconic designs for their campus buildings. And the reason for that is that what they need to do in their line of business is attract students to their campus. And if your campus is special because of the buildings being special, then you go for it. So yeah. I think it's, you know, it's, I it's... I was about to say, I definitely say it's a very iconic building with which then now everybody knows. So I suppose if there was more buildings that actually looked like that building, it would no longer be the iconic building it is in London. Um, but we um going to wrap it up for today. So I'd just like to say thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Um, thank you so much, Rob, um, for your presentation. We have um, the next um, ACE uh, webinar um, is next Thursday, and this is with the North West Group. They'll be hosting a webinar on the power of mentoring. So please visit the ACE um, website and register if you'd like to attend. Um, I'd just like to say again, thank you, Rob. Um, it was very interesting. I always like to hear about it, and it's quite nice because then I can go and tell other people cool facts about it because inevitably you'll be with friends walking around London so you those, can... Those names were Steve Larson and Glenn Kahlo. <laughs> right, I better remember that. Um, and just a reminder that um, this webinar has been recorded and will be going later on to the website. Um, so if you'd like to re-listen to it or forward it on to any of your colleagues to listen to, um, please direct them to the ACE website and that will be up um, later on today. And um, so I'd just like to say thank you again, Rob, and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.